Uh, this is Mark Patterson. Uh, open the meeting of the New York State um, uh, New York State Cemetery's New meeting, uh, a regular meeting uh, on April 14th. This is a new era. We're uh, doing this through remote, so there's some additional rules or conventions that I just want to remind people of. One, the meeting is being recorded. Uh, two, we keep a transcript of this, so if everybody could identify themselves when they speak and each time they speak, that's very uh, helpful. Uh, also, if you're not speaking, uh, keep your um, microphone or phone on mute. That helps. <clears throat> um, uh, we will be trying to engage. This is a public meeting. Um, uh, we'll go over some of that in a minute. But, uh, again, uh, if you can or know how to identify yourself and you're on WebEx and you would like to ask a question or participate in the public meeting section near the end of the meeting, you can also use the chat function if you know how to do it. Ask a question and I can call on you. Uh, if not, I will open it up at the end to people who have uh, questions um, and uh, figure out how to manage that. Again, identify yourself uh, so we can keep a record uh, of, of that. Um, okay, let me uh, introduce the members of the board. I'm Mark Patterson, representing Secretary of State Rosanna Rosano. Our Attorney General uh, representative is... Hi, this is Jill Faber, and I'm representing Attorney General Letitia James. And this is Tom Fuller. I'm representing Dr. Howard Zucker for the Department of Health. That's fabulous. Thank you again. Uh, we also, and we'll ask them to introduce themselves, but we have here uh, Louis Polishuk, who's the director of the program, Alicia Young, who's the assistant director of the program, uh, and Tony Melillo, who's our counsel, and other staff members who are available um, if we need to we have questions. Let me just give an overview of the agenda um, just to go through it first so that people know when we'll be able to uh, cover things. Uh, uh, we'll have Tony work give us just again an explanation of the new rules allowing for remote meetings and our public notice, what we've done to do that. If the members have any questions about that, board members, they can ask them then. We'll approve the minutes uh, of our last board meeting, not the special board meeting, but our last board meeting. We'll have a legislation and rules and regulations report, the division report, uh, the vandalism report, and then we will present two applications for consideration uh, during that time after we introduce them and present that by staff. Uh, I'll uh, make a motion to uh, approve for the discussion. Um, we'll be discussed by board members on each one that we'll vote and go through that. Um, we also will then have a public uh, uh, session, uh, invite the public to speak, uh, and then motion to adjourn. So uh, that's the overview of the agenda. Uh, let me first just ask Tony if he will talk to us again and just remind us about the rules for um, remote meetings and how we are uh, ensuring that we're in compliance. Tony? Here we go. Okay, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> All right, um, so we are doing this under uh, new rules to um, Governor Cuomo's Executive Order 202.1. Uh, pursuant to that Executive Order, Article 7 of the Public Offices Law, which is uh, the other meetings law, is modified to the extent necessary to permit any public body to meet and take such actions authorized by the law without permitting in public, in person access to meetings and authorizing such meetings to be held remotely by conference call or similar service, provided that the public has the ability to view or listen to such proceedings and that such meetings are recorded and later transcribed. Which as Mark explained, we are, we are doing, we are recording on transcribe. This executive order has been interpreted to suspend the requirement that board members be physically convened or convened by video conference. In other words, they can be all in separate rooms, uh, and not see each other, uh, if, if necessary. 
and to suspend the requirement that notice of the meeting include the physical location of each board member. We have given the public notice of how to attend the meeting by video conference or by telephone conference, and the board agenda and board material have been placed on the Division of Secretary's website. Thank you, Tony. Uh, does, uh, does any of the board members have any uh, questions regarding uh, our uh, compliance with the rules for remote meetings? Uh, do you have any questions? No questions here. Okay, Tom, Joe. Okay, I'll take that as a no and we'll uh, move on. Uh, First thing on the agenda is the approval of the minutes that were distributed with the board report. Does anybody have any um, changes or corrections to the minutes? Uh, this is Jill. I have no um, changes or questions. Thank you. Mr. Tom, I have none either. Thank you. So I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as distributed. Uh, in our board packet, do we have a second? I will second that. Thank you, Tom. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, okay. Aye. Most carries. Uh, the next thing we have is um, the rule legislation uh, and rules and regulations report from uh, Tony. Sure. Um, so on legislation. <coughs> Not a lot of activity. They were very focused, the legislature was, on the budget uh, last month. Um, there is uh, number 26 on the list. This is uh, Assembly Bill 7652, Senate Bill 5591. Uh, this would make it illegal for a cemetery to pay anyone other than a regular employee a commission bonus, rebate, or other thing of value in connection with the sale of a lot. Um, it would make an exception for a contract with a third-party vendor that uses internet websites. Um, well, actually, let me correct that. Current law makes it illegal to pay a commission at bonus, et cetera. This would add an exception to that for a third-party vendor that uses internet websites to offer goods services to the public for a fee. Um, the Senate bill has advanced to the third reading. Now, if you look at the end of my list, Actually, a bill that I should have captured last month, somehow I, I knew about it, but I didn't get into the report. This is uh, the last item, number 32 on the list, Assembly 9839, Senate 7822. This bill would amend the MPCL to assert new sections 1505-B and 1508 to allow a cemetery corporation to dispose of remains by natural organic reduction to operate a natural organic reduction facility. Uh, it includes uh, disposition of remains by natural organic reduction in the definition of a cemetery corporation. Um, and uh, the term natural organic reduction means uh, the contained accelerated conversion of human remains to soil. In layman's term, it's uh, composting of human remains. It's being done in one state, I can't remember if it's Washington or Oregon. Um, and basically, the, the bill tracks approvals and uh, oversight of uh, crematories. So if a cemetery were to decide to do this, it would be our review, the board's review, and the division's regulation would be similar to the way we uh, handle um, crematories. So that is in both houses, but no action yet. And then on the, well, let me ask if there are any questions on the uh, legislation before I move on. Okay. Um, so actually, uh, on the um, regulation, I think I'll defer to Lewis on that. Um, I think our last step was to ask the board for authority to uh, take what we had produced and take that to um, interested parties and so that we could meet with them. But I, I, I'm not quite sure where we are on that, so I'll leave that to Lewis. Yeah. Yeah, I think the board members were supposed to affirmatively, uh, this is Mark Patterson, I think the board members were supposed to affirmatively uh, indicate that it was okay 
make those talking points or outlines public. And Captain Lewis, do you have any update on the rules and regulations group? Yeah, I, I heard from Jill and you about sharing them. I never heard from Tom, despite the fact that Tom and I, or maybe because of the fact that Tom and I talk every day, several times a day. <laughs> okay. Well, then, two, two, to, two to one, either way, uh, we, I think we've made a decision we can stand in. So let's, uh, not to make Tom uh, irrelevant, but, uh, uh, but let's move on with that. So we'll take that as an affirmative um, uh, action. Um, yeah, this is Tom. I think I did send an email to Lewis on that. Well, it's entirely possible I missed it, too. Okay. How could that be? All we do is look at emails. <laughs> Thousands of emails. <laughs> All right. So, Lewis, you're on the hook for the division report. Yes. And I am. And I apologize because I actually wrote it out for once, and I'm going to be looking at other screens to be um, giving it. So, obviously, the main topic to report for the division is, unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has had an impact on regulated cemeteries, especially downstate. Downstate crematories in particular have seen significantly increased volume. The division has taken the following steps concerning COVID-19 as it relates to cemeteries. One, we put guidance on our website concerning the safe handling of remains, um, graveside services and social distancing, which was recently updated. I believe it was either yesterday or Sunday. So um, if you haven't visited that piece of our website recently, Go there and hit refresh. There's a little more guidance there. Uh, remote completion and witnessing of the authorization for cremation and disposition where the family member and funeral director can't be in the same place. Second, we've asked all New York State crematories to provide the division with a daily report via an electronic form that we've devised. Thanks to Brendan Stanton for that. Uh, concerning the crematory's caseload to monitor which crematories are more heavily burdened which have additional cremation capacity. We have used that to provide contact uh, to people interested in using different crematories, and I believe there are funeral directors from downstate, you know, using crematories farther afield. We have asked downstate cemeteries to uh, uh, provide updates concerning burial capacity and operations. We have attempted to address concerns brought to our attention by families and funeral directors concerning cemeteries and crematories generally, especially as it relates to COVID-19. We've worked with the state's mortuary affairs task force working group to try to address concerns that affect cemeteries and crematories during COVID-19. We've handled various inquiries from the public and funeral directors and the cemeteries and crematories themselves. Last week, as the board know, and some of our audience knows, um, the state cemetery board and Department of Environmental Conservation both approved on an expedited basis the addition of two retorts at a Suffolk County crematory, Mount Pleasant Cemetery, to handle increased volume. Those retorts have arrived. Uh, they're probably being install, installed and hooked up as we speak and hopefully should be operational tomorrow, which should increase their and downstate's cremation capacity. A couple um, – so first – sorry – um, unrelated to COVID-19, unfortunately, Central Crematory in um, Cortland experienced a fire at the uh, Associated Vault Company next door. Um, the um, fire did not did not originate in, did not damage the crematory, but it did knock out the source of electrical power to the crematory. So they're currently offline, which is causing some problems in uh, in that region. I believe the funeral directors have mostly been going to uh, to Dryden, New York, uh, to the crematory there. Um, the final point is in response to uh, Mr. Fleming's comments from last week about cemeteries possibly having trouble making uh, repayment on permanent its loans, we would ask that uh, – those cemeteries that would like some form of loan restructuring, debt relief, whatever you want to call it, get in touch with us 
and we can hopefully put something together for the board for recommendations for the next month. Uh, that's all I have on the division report. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions of Lewis uh, about his report or other uh, issues? Uh, Jill? Uh, no. No questions. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, just one question. Did any uh, any sense of how long the Cortland crematory will be out of commission? I have not heard that. Brendan, are you on? I am. Uh, this is Brendan Stanton, the, the division. Uh, I do not have any uh, updates on that at this time. Um, they said that the vault company was uh, substantially damaged, but that was uh, the last information that I had. Actually, this is Jill again. I, I, I do have a I do have a question, Lewis. Um, if um, if I could ask that before we move on. Um, you referenced some new guidance on the division's website about funeral gatherings. Um, I know that the previous guidance was based on, or I believe it was based on a Department of Health memo that was dated around March 17th. Um, is the new guidance that you referenced in your report just now based on an update, updated guidance from Department of Health? The short answer is yes. Okay. The longer answer is that our previous guidance was um, the, 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 the DOH memo you're referring to was the previous, previous guidance. Okay. There was one that came in in between that somehow didn't find its way to the AG's website. Okay. And that was my question. In terms of information that we all put out to the public with DOH and the division's most updated guidance, um, are those – is that publicly available from DOH now as well? Um the short answer is I would actually, I mean, I defer to Tom on that, but I'd actually recommend you look at our website because we okay. tweak ours to cover both funerals and cemeteries. Okay. So it includes everything the DOH one did, but also has a little bit of cemetery-specific stuff. Okay. Okay, this is Tom. Um, we did do an updated uh, guidance. Uh, based on some clarification from the governor's office on the executive order, uh, and that is posted on, on the Bureau of Funeral Directing website on the DOH uh, side, as well as um, I know the state uh, funeral director association is, is also posted on their website. So uh, funeral directors should be very very aware of what the current guidance is, and it does touch on the uh, gatherings of cemeteries as well. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions of board members for Lewis's division report? Yeah, I'll take that as a uh, move on then to uh, our vandalism report. Uh, Lewis or Alicia? This Alicia, can you do this one? I don't actually have it up yet. Sure, sure. So, vandalism report. So far in the calendar year 2020, we have uh, collected $401,182 in vandalism funds. Assessment collections were $225,220. The fiscal year collection starting April 1st, vandalism $16,850, assessments $8,388. We spent the entire 2019-2020 uh, $2 million by the end of March 31st. Uh, there is $776,397 worth of outstanding applications from prior years that will be paid from the current appropriation. That leaves about $1.2 million available for 2020-21 applications. Uh, we have no vandalism applications on the agenda this month. Uh, annual reports. We have received 962 annual reports for 2019. Of that, 317 were filed online using our online application, representing about 33% of all reports filed. 
which is a better rate than last year. Um, I've noted that there's about a 25% uh, increase in requests for extensions this year. Mostly they're citing the inability to get together to sign reports. And that's it. I can't recall whether we um, mentioned this at the last meeting, uh, but um, we have uh, announced, I think I mentioned it at the special meeting, either at the special meeting or the previous meeting, we announced that we are going to um, um, allow for um, everyone to have up to, we normally give a 30-day extension on the annual report, no questions asked. This year we're giving everyone 60 days, which is, in other words, through May 31st, if they have a March 31st deadline, no questions asked. If you need more time than that, you can always uh, give us a call. Okay. Hey, thank you, Lisa. Um, so I think the agenda now takes us uh, to two applications from cemeteries, uh, uh, the first is for Boston Spa Cemetery for a columbarium. Uh, Lewis is presenting that uh, to the board. Brendan, I'm actually going to you, you do that. Sure. Uh, Brendan Stan with the division. Um, Boston Spa Cemetery in uh, Saratoga County uh, is applying to the cemetery board to install a 16-inch columbarium. It's uh, double um, double occupancy crypt, so it'll be 120 interments. Um, the cemetery currently does not have any columbarium units. Um, this is their first unit um, based on what they believe to be demand in the area, um, based on, you know, what they've heard from funeral directors and what they've heard from people approaching the cemetery seeking to uh, have that service in the cemetery. Uh, they think that it will sell well. Um, they only have six acres remaining for sale, so this will be um, a very good use of, of some of their remaining space. Um coupled with the increase in the cremation rate throughout the state. Um, the total cost of the project is $53,100, which is uh, approximately $38,000 for the unit, uh, $1,300 for shipping, $2,000 for the foundation work, $1,400 to install it, uh, $8,000 for walkways and landscaping associated with it, $2,000 for benches, and $500 for signage and advertising. Um, that is that is uh, the the basic project, um, and I submit it to the board for consideration. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, any other staff input on that? I and mean, I'll get to the council in a second. Uh, any other accountant or anybody else um, commenting on their application? This is Andrew Hickey from Binghamton, uh, and I'm the accountant who uh, did the uh, summary of the project, and uh, I'll be available for any questions. Uh, Tony, do you have uh, questions or comments you'd like to raise? Yes, yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> so, well, there's an overall concern, I think, about the viability of this cemetery. Um, it has $195,000 in general funds. I don't know how much that's changed since that number was last reported, but um, $60,000 of this project is going to come out of that, so it's going to be $135,000 in general funds. It's been it's it, its operations are at a loss every year. <clears throat> They've been covered some years by um, dividend and income from their investments, but um, as an operation. The, Constantly running at a deficit, deficit of at least thirty forty thousand a year. Um, with what's happening with the stock market, I don't think we can count on um, investment income covering losses this year or in the near future. Um, so we're looking at you know, even with the the modest income that this project will provide each year, 
um, continued losses. Um, so I think I raise that not to, to, to caution against approving this. I mean, this, this application will provide some additional funds, but I'm just, uh, I just raise that to, so it's on everybody's radar. Um, I did have a question. There's a special trust uh, with about $600,000 in there. I was wondering if that is available for um, general operating expenses or if there's restrictions on the use of that. Andrew, do you know? There, the the short answer on that, Tony, is they're not using that for the columbarium. Going back to your question as far as that income, that that income does flow to the general fund. Um, but at this point right now, I can't attest to whether there's, you know, if that's allowed or not. My question would be yes, but I'd have to look at that. Is that the better or an, answer? Or an attorney would have to look at it, probably be the better answer. Sorry to interrupt. Andrew, was that the bequest that's referenced somewhere else? Is that a different trust? There's the six, the 675,000 is the, the Montague. Okay. And on, on the balance sheet, that shows as special trust to the account number of 8374. I was wondering if the principal um, is restricted or if the principal could be used as well. Because obviously, if this cemetery is heading towards yearly deficits, if they could use the principal, that would extend the life. But, um, That's a good point. Going back to that. Part of it is the way our annual reports are set up. Now, in 2015 and 16, they uh, in, uh, took on some large capital projects. And that were really the two years that they had the losses. Now, those they understand that that has to cease at least unless there were other donations. But they do have operating break-even or, I would say, small surpluses. Because overall, from 2015 to 2018, the cost basis of their holdings has actually increased a little over $100,000. The problem is their dividends that they do earn, Tony, aren't shown as income, but as transfers. So if you were to look at that, the tail end of the income statement, it shows the income transferred over from their investment holdings. In general, that is actually a, it's a small surplus. <laughs> Take the 2015 capital project that was ninety thousand dollars. If you take that away, they they will operate at surpluses, assuming their dividend income stays consistent and their lot sales and expenses stay consistent. I have spoken with them, and we're in process of changing how they report to better do an annual summary of what their actual results are, including dividend and interest income, and not showing as a transfer down below. But those transfers, I mean, they, they've they actually had surpluses in a way, because if you look at their total assets, their total assets have gone from $1.3 million to $1.4 million. The only way that's possible is if you have surpluses. And as you say, their operational is at a loss. But if you factor in dividends and, and income, they're actually a small break even. And that's even with those very large capital projects three and four years ago. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that's a great point, but I, I think that they're, they're closer to surplus, very small, and uh, they can't tackle those large capital projects again. But uh, as it goes, they do operate at surplus. It's just – it's the uniqueness of the way our annual report is. And we need to work with them to better complete that. And a lot of that, I think, is on the division as well to help show that their dividends and interest do bring them up to break even, although their operational lot sales and burial income are probably only 50% of what their expenses are. Yeah, right, exactly. Thank but you. I can – from – from my analysis, and, and if we were to just look at the cost basis of their holdings, and market value is greater than cost, they've actually increased, their assets have increased from 2015 to $1.3 million 
to, as of 2018, $1.4 million. So it's, it's a great point that you make, but actually with dividend and interest, they, they achieve small surpluses. Because 2020 is going to be a very different year for all of us. It, so. a, exactly, exactly. They gave us some assurance that as of, uh, I think the date was March 26th, their cost basis, although down somewhat, uh, it was not a, a material drop. Their market value, yes, was. They're, they're invested very much in fixed income, so uh, their drop was not as severe as, say, someone who had a 401K that might be more equity-oriented. They are very income-based, and that was a little bit less impacted by this recent downturn. So the thing. yield should be somewhat similar. The yield shouldn't necessarily drop off. Um, but you're right, the market values may not be as, as I won't say inflated, but as high as they were uh, February 2020. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, just two other points I wanted to raise. Um, one, this is the, the cemetery's first columbarium, so it has no market experience. Um, therefore, you know, the estimates, they, they, they could meet their estimates of how much they're going to sell a year. They may not. Um, Agreed. They, they, they don't have a marketing plan, so they're hopeful that, you know, the, the market, these will sell themselves. Um, and I believe uh, Division worked with them on coming up with prices. So Correct. all of that is new for them, and so we'll have to see going forward how that works out. And then the other thing I wanted to raise, um, we did have a board member who actually um, bid on two parts of this project, the, the um, columbarium itself and then the work to install. Um, the report notes that they do have uh, a conflict of interest policy in place. Uh, the, the question I have is whether um, the, the division had an opportunity to see what this particular person, I think it's the cemetery superintendent, submitted to make sure he disclosed his outside interests that clearly creates a conflict uh, because he's bidding on work for the cemetery. I'm going to assume, uh, this is Andrew Hickey, I'm assuming that, Brendan, you talked to Bill about that. And Bill is available if we need to reach out to him as well. Yeah, this is Brendan Sitton. Um, I did uh, inquire about that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, where this came about is when they first decided to uh, install this unit, they contacted the division, and the division staff member told them it would be no problem to just have the board member um, and, and I, I don't want to use the term board member. I, I'm not sure if he's a board member. He is a cemetery employee. He is a contractor. Um, but anyhow, the, the division staff member told the cemetery that there would be no no conflict of interest issues as long as they got another bid. Um, I requested that they get some additional bids uh, just so that, you know, not that we suspected it were anything else, but that it was very clear that, you know, that they didn't uh, look at one bid and then fudge the other one. Um, I, I'm confident that that's not the case. They have uh, – I, I included some supporting documentation that they uh, did request of their estimates for, you know, similar units and, and were unable to uh, find any that were better than the price that they did go with, and I do want to note they did not go with the uh, cemetery contractors did. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly what the process was for him refusing himself, but uh, it certainly appears that uh, his bid was not improper and did not influence this process. Had we had they in fact gone with the related party bid, of course, we would have had uh, the minutes and uh, examine them to make sure they comply with the Revitalization Act. They didn't go with the uh, related party bid. Can I remind? Thank you. Uh, remind people to mute your line if you're not speaking. I hear some background there. Uh, that's great, uh, Lewis or uh, Tony. Any other uh, comments, questions?
Sorry, uh, I forgot I was on you. No, those are the only points I wanted to raise. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to make a motion uh, to approve uh, the application of the Bluffstock Cemetery for a columbarium. Uh, uh, if I get a second, then we'll have a board discussion. Do I have a second? It is time. I will second that. Thank you, Tom. Uh, are there any questions or comments from board members? Uh, Jill, do you want to go first? Yes, I, I have just one question with regard to um, the the. I, I think that it's expected that there will be um, sixty sold um, within sixty niches sold within um, four point five years. Um, just um, going back to what Tony said about this being the first columbarium. I was just wondering where that number came from. Is that just adding up the 14 that, um, you know, uh, cremations per year that exist now um, and projecting that into the future, or was there some analysis done to arrive at that number? Uh, this is Andrew Hickey. I'm the accountant in Binghamton mm -hmm. that worked with them. Um, I spoke with Bill Curtis on that. Uh, they don't have any uh, – you know, official marketing information. They basically three data points that they took us from. One was verbal assertions from people and funeral homes saying that there is material demand for niche sales. Um, and secondly, related to that, in, in that general area, there isn't this particular service, you know, niche column variants for, uh, people to use in the Saratoga area. And then thirdly, uh, there was, this goes a little bit converse to what Bill just said about that, was there's a local church that sells in, that sells 50 to 60, I think Bill referenced, annually as far as columbariums, a Catholic church. So it was based, I think, largely on the feedback from funeral homes and family members that they, they did have a, a material interest in this service um, and the lack of what's available there in a, in a, in a regulated cemetery, although there, I, I guess there is one, there is that service in a Catholic cemetery. But that was what Bill Curtis had expressed to me, why they believe they would be able to sell a reasonable number uh, and, and estimate that it would sell out in approximately five years. So in other words, good, good information. Oh, sorry, this is Jill. I just went. So good information about local market conditions, if you will. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, Tom, do you have any additional questions uh, regarding this application? Uh, no, not at this time. Thank you. Okay. I've made a motion to uh, uh, approve. We had a second. It's on the table. We have a. And I, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, all three members indicated uh, voting aye. The application is uh, approved. Thank you for everybody's participation in that. Uh, the next one is one, um, and I'll do a little setup on this. This is, uh, we're bringing back um, the application uh, from uh, Letter Stocking Crematory. Uh, when they first applied two months ago, um, we, I'm not sure what we, if we reminded whether we denied it or just tabled it, uh, there were certain areas where they were not in compliance. Uh, I think they show uh, at least uh, a reasonable basis for replacing the retort. It's an old retort. It will increase not their capacity, but not increase their general overall uh, I mean, not adding capacity, they're just uh, going to fill back up uh, from an old report. Um, there were three things, if I remember, that we particularly were concerned about. One was they hadn't, uh, they were paying some staff in a way which might have been uh, improper in terms of a uh, commission. Uh, the other was that this, there's a lease for the building, so it's a related third-party uh, transaction. We needed, they didn't have any independent board members, they needed to add uh, some independent board members, and they hadn't filed their uh, CPA audit for us for a couple of years. Uh, we told them that we would, wouldn't would consider this until they met certain benchmarks. My understanding is that they've uh, 
uh, added the board members, although I think they may have run afoul of COVID in terms of an actual board meeting. I'm going to ask for an update from Lewis. And then yep. uh, they uh, uh, have con contracted. They've changed the way they pay their employees. We've confirmed that. Uh, and they have a contract with a CPA firm with a date uh, of um, completion to get us two of the three audits they owe us. The reason we brought it back up was uh, because of the press for crematory capacity, uh, it seemed like they are heading in the right direction. It might be worth the board's consideration uh, to reconsider whether or not we're ready or not to say they're doing enough for us to approve this uh, retort. So, Lewis, can you make sure I'm correct about the, the update? Sure. There were the, there were four – they've addressed basically – they have started to address four basic concerns. Um, concern number one was the compensation issue that you mentioned. Um, they are no longer compensating their non-employees per cremation. They're being paid a fixed amount. So that's what they've done on that piece. They also have – I can't remember if it was their accountant or a payroll guy, but they consulted someone who advised that it was appropriate for them to treat these guys as independent contractors as opposed to um, employees. Um, I don't have a formal report on that. I frankly, my, our concern, my concern was with our statute, not with whatever IRS or Department of Labor rules would be involved there. Um, the second issue on um, the audit, yes, they've retained an auditor. The auditor is someone we're familiar with. They've told us they'll have the, net, the two years of financials by the end of this month. They have not, by the way, told us they're going to need additional time on that. So that's a good thing. And um, on the third piece, they've added the independent trustees. The independent trustees have received the lease documents, which I think is the only – that and the compensation of the uh, uh, people who do the cremation work who are either – also funeral director staff were related to them. Um, so they've received that. They haven't really met on it to follow the uh, uh, Revitalization Act procedure for reviewing um, related party transactions. Uh, they had intended to meet on March 27th. They didn't have an in-person meeting. They had some kind of telephonic touch base, but I don't think they actually formally considered those. And um, But they, they at least, you know, we will continue to, guide them on what they need to do to give independent consideration to these arrangements. Um, I'll remind everyone that back in January when this was last substantively presented, our view is just in the abstract, the amount they're paying on, in rent seems, as best as we can tell, not being commercial real estate appraisers, a reasonable amount. It didn't seem off the wall. Again, that's you shouldn't take our word for it. It's that's the job of the independent trustees, but there wasn't something flashing red lights type red flag. The last thing is the um, – we were concerned last time about the interest rate. They had renegotiated uh, with the bank, and Andrew, would, would they go from 7% to 5.75? Did I recall that correctly? Those numbers are basically right. They were at 7.75%, and now they're down to 5.75. 5.75%. And, and they're borrowing a smaller sum, too, correct? Correct, which improves the return on investment materially on the, the purchase. And uh, uh, this is not one of the busiest crematories. Sorry about that. This is not one of the busiest crematories in the state, but we're concerned given the situation downstate and now beginning to be very busy in the capital region as well with spillover that um, every little bit of functioning retort helps. And even if they're only doing 150, 250 cases a year, if they go offline, those have to go somewhere, and the places they would likely go, Vail is probably the – and Parkview, are now getting a bunch of uh, downstate overflow. So we think that they're acting in good faith. They're tr moving in the direction of compliance, and uh, we're recommending that the board approve it. Lewis, do you have any information about timeliness, meaning uh, if, they, if it was approved, how soon? I know with the, with the uh, cemetery crematory that we approved in the last week, we knew 
the Matthews could be there the next days, and in fact, they're already uh, practically up and running. Do you know anything about that for this this uh, thing? Brendan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they said a couple weeks. I don't know anything different than that. Um, that that sounds correct. Thank you, uh, uh, Tony. Do you have issues? I know that initially there's some other issues that you uh, were talking about. Is there any other issues that you'd like to raise for this for the board's consideration? Yeah, just uh, just a few. Um, Lewis, I think the the updated report indicates that they're providing um, two years of financial reports by the end of this month. Um, but I think they were they were missing quite a few. My my right. last look was 2015 forward. So I think it's 2016. Forward. 2016, I think. Okay. Uh, what about the rest? How how are they catching up? I think what we had discussed at the last what we discussed at the January meeting, and I think what, and what we discussed with them is with each year going forward, they'd catch up with another year. Okay. So but we want to we want to review this. Um, first before we do anything else. I'm sorry? We'd like to actually see this before we do anything else. See this? I don't know what you mean. I see what their actual audit uh, financials look like. Oh, right. That, yeah, that was... we send them to do more, we want to make sure that they're doing them right, that they're providing us the useful information, etc. Yeah, I think I was actually going to raise that point myself, that, you know, just the fact that they filed by April 30th, assuming they comply with uh, what they've indicated, doesn't mean that the report is will be full and complete and meet vision requirements. So that's something to watch for. Um, Tony, and I apologize. This, this is Andrew Hickey, the council from Binghamton. We do have a lot of experience with a CPA who's going to be doing this. Uh, not that that's any, you know, a, a, you know, uh, gives you any comfort, but uh, we work with her a lot, and she's she's very outstanding CPA, very above board on everything I've ever dealt with her on. So I just, I'll she, just takes this very, she takes this very seriously. I I know that this doesn't give you a lot of comfort, but that's one of the things that has come across my thought when dealing with this. It's going to be in you know April 30th, but I have a lot of confidence in it that her her report will be very meaningful and accurate. I appreciate that, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, I'm concerned the proof is in the pudding. I don't want to see it. Yeah, no, well said, Lewis. And, you know, this is one of the tricky ones. It's it's a uh, combination, you know, home, crematory. Um, the division knows better than I that, you know, when we see that kind of relationship, there's usually assets that are go both ways, uh, employees, uh, equipment. And I think in this case, um, I noted earlier that the rent payment includes uh, might include the building or the retorts, so they really it's it's it requires extra scrutiny because of that relationship. So they're not renting the retorts in this case. The retorts are owned by the crematory. Then right. Uh, well, the, the existing ones are the ones that they're. they're yes. The retorts are owned by the crematory. The new retort will be, the old one will be. There's none of that funny dude. Great. So the other question I have was about the board members. Uh, how big is their board? You said they have two new board members who are not related. Hold on one second. I've got a little emergency here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have, uh, I think maybe seven board members. Tony, this is Andrew Hickey. I mean, I don't have that schedule. It'll take me a minute to pull it up. Okay. Um, so, you know, my concern is that, you know, the, the the board members who are family or friends of uh, the regional home operator, um, will be recusing themselves on these cross-relation matters, whether it's his salary, um, payments going from one to the other, that type of thing. So um, it can be tricky. And, you know, what is their quorum then? 
Um, can they meet a quorum if the only people voting on these things are the two uh, unrelated board members? Generally, what they do is that they would vote present for the purposes of having a quorum. Jill, you can correct me. Is that uh, where you have a minority that's independent? Is that how regular not-for-profits handle it? That's how regular not-for-profits handle it. Okay, great. Um, take a quick look. In good faith, it's really the extra pressure of the added predatory capacity that has brought this to the fore. So I really think it's a decision the board can make, you know, uh, either either way. Um, I'll make a motion uh, to approve, uh, again, to get it on the table for discussion purposes. Do I have a second? This is Tom. I will second that. Great. And we can go the way. Uh, uh, is there any other questions that uh, you have, Jill, in this regard? Um, yes. I have a question, um, Lewis. Lewis, you said that they're scheduled at this point to get those reports um, filed by April 30th. Is that right? And that yep. would be two years. Um, so in terms of you know, of our approval, is there any reason, because it really does sound like there's a lot of, you know, potentially there's a lot of information that's going to be in those reports that'll be of significant value in analyzing the transaction. Is there any reason why um, we would, and I throw this out to the other board members, why we wouldn't wait until those are filed um, and, and review those and any impact that those have on our decision, evaluate that, and then put this over to the next meeting? Yes. Sorry. Yes, there's, there's a meeting. There's a reason not to wait. Um, that's why we're here. Otherwise, we would have waited. Um, we need, frankly, the state needs all the cremation capacity okay. it can get. We have, Vale is now operating at capacity and is unable to accept any more downstate business. Parkview, also in Schenectady, will probably be soon, soon be in that position. We, if they were to have to go offline because their retort needs repairs, there's, it would be silly for them to throw good money after bad to repair that retort when we're going to approve its replacement in May. And furthermore, we also don't want them going offline at all because we can't afford to lose any cremation capacity. Okay. Those are all good reasons. Thank you. I think, Jill, the other – well, I, I'm not really being an advocate here. When we have the opportunity to review the, uh, you know, application, we look at these other issues because it's, it's a time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have other enforcement um, – you know, capacity beyond approving the retort or not. So if some of the information there uh, proves to be problematic, that doesn't stop us from from uh, taking other other actions. So uh, again, it's 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 not uh, your point is is reasonable, uh, except for with this current um, circumstances that we're in. The only reason I would do exactly what you said under normal circumstances. And that's what we said two months ago. Uh, but uh, with the uh, pressure on, on capacity of pressure, it seems like we might want to give a little on that one and hopefully take care of other issues if they come up. So that's my view. Well, that certainly makes sense. I mean, to waive the requirement um, that they have those reports in place in favor of making sure that capacity around the state is addressed, that, me, that makes sense. Let me make something clear. We're not waiving any requirement. Mm -hmm. They are delinquent in their filing of annual reports, and we've proposed a plan that they, they they proposed a plan that we've essentially agreed to for them to come into compliance. There's nothing being waived. Yeah, right. Okay. The, the question is, do we wait until they've gotten closer to compliance? They're not going to come into compliance for a long time because they're, as Tony said. They didn't give us audited financials for 16 or 17 either. 
and we're not rushing them on those. Any other questions to for, for us, Jill, to the board concerns? No. No. Do you have any questions? Tom, are you still with us? Uh, I see Tom. Um, Tom, you may be muted. I, I, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I have no more questions. Okay. So I've made the motion. It's on the table. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All three board members have indicated their approval. The motion uh, is approved. Um, thank you for that. Uh, at this point, we are... Um, at the public, uh, I guess we could say, when's our next board meeting? I always kind of forget that. Um, was, yeah. It is scheduled for May 12th. It was originally supposed to be at the NISAC conference. The NISAC conference has been postponed. So depending on where things stand, we will have a meeting either virtually or in um, uh, room 1112 at uh, One Commerce Plaza at 10.30 a.m. on uh, May 12th. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, get the public. Uh, the opportunity to speak. I don't know if anybody raised their hand in the chat. Uh, does anybody on the web that would like to speak? Uh, David, you want to take the lead just because I know you're there? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. It's David Plumbing, representing the New York State Association of Cemeteries. Um, I just want to start out by um, thanking uh, Mr. Polishuk and uh, Mr. Fuller for spending every day with me, including my Easter for, and, uh, you know, hours on end for the last couple of weeks as we deal with um, this pandemic, which is uh, dramatically impacting uh, the region of New York City, uh, really to the point that it's not functioning. Uh, we have bodies stacking up unbelievably in the city. Wait times are well into uh, the month of May at some of our crematories um, where there are daily reports of um, – past daily reports of bodies being sent to um, temporary burials even after they've been um, designated for claim by the families, and that's just because there is not enough refrigeration capacity. This is incredibly disturbing uh, for our members, particularly if we receive these remains at a later date. Um, God only knows how long these plain pine boxes with no embalmed bodies are going to be in the ground before they're disinterred or they're sent to a crematory. So that's that's a public health problem, I think, long term, not just for the uh, immediate situation. Um, and frankly, 1501 of the not for profit corporation law, which as we've discussed, we've litigated with you folks many times over the last 30 years, um, is clear in that it designates significant police powers to the state of New York and with regards to handling of the dead. And frankly, the city of New York has proven that they're unable to handle this situation, and it becomes a statewide issue where we need to see that some crematories, uh, like we discussed today at this meeting, that are not at capacity start receiving uh, remains more than they already are as quickly as possible. We think there is a state role. We certainly have been advocating that, as have other folks who are at this meeting. Um, you know, but it's not happening fast enough, and it needs to be addressed as quickly as possible. I'd also point out that while we're, you know, in desperate need of um, retorts, as we've talked about at this meeting today, um, what's clear is that whatever parameters are being discussed or have been discussed in the past relating to capacity across the state are completely inaccurate. Um, we do not have enough crematory capacity in the state of New York, period. We have to rely on outside states with – uh, none of the legal protections for our consumers that are currently existing in the state of New York. This pandemic has dramatically shown that, even in areas where we have, um, quote-unquote, overcapacity in non-pandemic times, um, those those areas aren't even able to handle and absorb the number of loss of life that we have in New York. 
And as tragic as this pandemic is and has been for the people, the state, it's not anywhere near what they projected it would have been. And had we been at that level of depth in New York, we would be completely unable uh, to handle this even greater public health emergency with um, bodies literally being stacked in the cities. And that's happening now in the state of, in the city of New York in refrigerated trucks, which we just do not have enough uh, capacity. Also, the 30% reduction in retorts based on the new regulations from DEC are going to have an impact. And frankly, um, we're going to be looking for uh, some additional state support to get additional retorts built in the state of New York as quickly as possible. There are facilities across the state where uh, we could put in retorts right away. Unfortunately, the cremation companies can't turn these retorts around other than the ones that are already currently in production, and they've all been spoken for. Uh, as you've seen from your last meeting where you approved that the retort that was put up rather quickly. Um, additionally, we're hearing from uh, big stories still across the state that PPE is just incredibly difficult to come by. Uh, the state has been extremely helpful, and I want to commend Mr. Polishuk in particular with um, state emergency management where they've now designated in writing um, that cemetery workers are frontline workers, and therefore they should be uh, getting access to the PPE. Um, and I can't underscore enough the members of our association while they're not talked about, although you've seen a number of articles probably in the last two weeks, um, how important they have been in this uh, response to this crisis. We have folks who are literally working around the clock, 24-7, to handle people who talk about the health care side of the response to this pandemic, but there is a death care side. And unfortunately, we've lost well over 10,000 New Yorkers uh, to, this, to this terrible virus. They have to be handled and they're being handled by our frontline workers with extremely limited resources, very uh, few access, uh, not a lot of access to PPE, um, and we're seeing the price that they're paying for that constant work, and we're starting to see retorts go down uh, in the state where they have been overworked to the point that they're they're breaking down. And when one of these brick line retorts go down, it takes probably two weeks to get them repaired. So with every loss of a machine, it puts us in a more difficult situation. So I want to commend the work that's been done, but I think we have a lot more work to do. I appreciate that um, the folks at this meeting have been real advocates for our members. Um, I, I only wish that some people would listen uh, a little more acutely to the needs of the industry at this extremely difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, David. I do know that uh, some there's a uh, Daily brief every morning at eight o'clock, uh, even the agency update, and there's just been a constant push to get the PPEs out to the counties, which is where our cemeteries make their requests through. So there's always problems with enough and priorities and all that. Uh, you know, uh, those are tough choices to make, and it's the county emergency operation to make them. But I know it's a priority to get get things to there and uh, I'm glad that we've got our guys on the our folks on the list so thank you for that David uh, is there anybody else that, on the WebEx that wants to uh, speak to the board is there anybody on the phone that would like to speak to the board okay uh, uh, I appreciate that uh, I don't think there's anything else for the board to consider at this point. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Mark, it's Alicia. Alicia, I'd like yes. to get a full attendance of everybody that's on the line. Uh, go ahead. How are you going to do that? Well, I'm gonna, I can see who's on. Um, there are a couple people that I don't recognize their names. Um, okay. Emily. Josh Davis is on mute. Okay, Josh, you're on. Okay. Uh, see someone named Emily. I am not familiar with Emily and her affiliation. This is Josh Potato. Do you want me to manually unmute everybody? Sure. Oh, can you do that, please? Yeah, unless they Thank do you. it themselves separately. Okay, everybody okay. should be unmuted now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> um.
Okay. Emily? Yes, I'm here. Yes. You are with? I'm sorry? Your last name, please? Oh, thanks. Z-H-A-N-G. Z-H-A-N-G. And you are with? Um, I'm just an individual, just a, a citizen listening okay. in. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, Nate Romagnola. Yeah, yes, Nate Romagnola. I am, uh, I'm from Whitehaven Memorial Park. Whitehaven, okay. And Nicholas? Nicholas DiBartolo? And J. Locke, I, I think it's John Locke from Pinemon. I believe we have uh, Brendan Stanton, Michael Seelman, Kerry McGovern, Andrew Hickey, Joe Ambrose, Kathleen Richardson, and Josh Beans on the phone from the division. Is there anybody I left out? Me. <laughs> well, I know you're there. I don't. Uh, Alicia, thank you for that. Uh, we'll do that. And, and if anybody is on a <laughs> WebEx or on the phone uh, that could, if you sent an email to us, uh, just giving your name and your attendance and your affiliation that we haven't already discussed, that would be great because we're required to take attendance. And, since I have a moment, I do want to give a shout out to uh, John Scotto and, uh, and David, uh, uh, who have been instrumental in keeping our uh, technology going. So thank you guys for that. It really worked out pretty well, on the things considered. So can I get a motion adjourned? Did I have a, did I do that all in favor? Joe, before we adjourn, uh, Alicia did set up a um, uh, a link for an executive session. Mm -hmm. I know you had raised last week the possibility of discussing things in executive session. We want to do that because if so, we will adjourn to executive session, put out this link and reopen that link. I, the issues that you and I had discussed that I thought might best be discussed in executive session, I, I think we've resolved those internally. Um, okay. Unless you think, that, unless you have some reason to want to discuss those today. As far as as far as I'm concerned, I have some some resolution. Okay, we should just adjourn then. All right, and that's what we would do though. We would close this meeting and go to a different meeting, so we could do we close and and say you know we'll go to this session, but we we won't come back out. Uh, we won't make any decisions. So okay, so I think have a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Aye. Again, my appreciation to everybody for their participation. Uh, it seems to work. It's a little more awkward, but uh, again, thank you very much for your, your uh, participation. Uh, have a good day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.